I'm Matti Apro, I'm a medical oncologist based in Genely in Switzerland, and I'm here at the BGICC meeting in Cairo in Egypt, uh, joined by Professor Hope Rugo. Yeah, and I'm uh, Dr. Hope Rugo, I'm a breast medical oncologist as well, and I work at the University of California, San Francisco, in San Francisco, California. And the topic that we would like to discuss mm -hmm. with you is about the use of GCSF and all the varieties of GCSF in the setting of breast cancer treatment to prevent fibrin neutropenia and other side effects related to chemotherapy. Indeed, I think it's a critical issue for all of us as we are trying to uh, do less is more, but also understand where more intensive therapy is also important. And in, certainly in the United States, where we're also now uh, incorporating biosimilars into our treatment, which I think you've been doing for many years. Indeed, in Europe, we have had the opportunity to use biosimilars uh, of uh, growth factors, epoetins, and GCSF for quite a few years. And there was a considerable debate at the time, and the debate has now faded away as everyone uh, has seen that these uh, agents are indeed uh, just as good as the so-called original agents. Uh, but I understand that in the States it's a little bit uh, new for some of my colleagues and there are some questions. What, what are the key questions that uh, you have in the United States about biosimilars? Well, I think overall with biosimilars, the therapeutic agents are going to face more questions and need more education. The supportive care medications, the growth factors, as you mentioned, uh, there's been a little bit easier path towards acceptance, uh, but people are still getting used to using those agents. And at our institution and with our insurers, we've mostly switched over to using the biosimilars for most patients, actually, and those are the drugs that get delivered to home, et cetera. I, I think people just feeling comfortable that the studies have really shown equivalency and then using the drugs in practice and seeing that there are no additional side effects and that they seem to work just as well has, has improved comfort a lot. So I've seen in the last six months, really the opinions have shifted tremendously. I think still as people who are lower volume users are still getting more used to it. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's true. You have to have the hands-on experience with all of these agents. And we know that now they're introducing other types of biosimilars in breast cancer. The debate is going to restart again. But uh, also we have to understand that uh, the original products that we have today it's like the cars we have today. We still speak about the uh, good old cars, but uh, they are not the same as they were 10 years ago. The same is true for medication. T techniques uh, change, uh, and under supervision of the FDA or EMA in Europe, uh, the, these products evolve. Uh, so at the end, uh, if I may, I know that many companies don't like me to say this, uh, today's original product is a biosimilar of the original offered 10 years ago. Yeah, I would agree, and it's really interesting because I think as the user on the user end, a lot of times we don't understand issues like you know the fact that you have to get approval to get a drug in a country based on where it's made. So there's already concerns, even about simple chemicals, you know. So even more so with biologics, for example, if you got it from the EU plant in Spain versus the American plant in wherever it is, North Carolina, you actually have to think about these as being different agents as well. So I think it's really a, <clears throat> an, an ongoing issue that people haven't understood. And uh, it's uh, on my end, I think it's great to have uh, the competition as well as drugs that are a little lower priced because for our patients who have often a share of cost, it's been a huge issue. And you know we have all these issues about whether people get drugs at home or in an infusion center, which I know don't exist so much in Europe. But you know the other thing that comes up a lot is uh, how we use growth factors, either short-acting or long-acting, in patients who have early-stage breast cancer. Uh, are you giving weekly therapy, dose dense, every three weeks, and how do you decide how to use the growth factors? That's right. Well, one of the questions that uh, many of uh, our colleagues ask when uh, we discuss with them is the lack of data on the weekly chemotherapy and how to use a growth factor of course, a short-acting one in that setting uh, to support weekly treatment uh, in settings where it is important to keep the dose intensity. So what's your take on that? Well, you know, there, so we use weekly therapy in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting with weekly paclitaxel. Uh, we tend really, uh, I think it's been a long time since I've given dose-dense paclitaxel um, or and certainly docetaxel uh, outside of a specific regimen. So weekly paclitaxel, if I'm going to give an anthracycline or with trastuzumab, 
and then docetaxel cyclophosphamide every three weeks for patients who are not giving an anthracycline to. Uh, with weekly therapy, <clears throat> as you know, most people tolerate the weekly therapy without growth factors. Uh, but in situations where neutropenia is an issue and we really want to keep up that uh, dose schedule and intensity because it's important for the outcome, which of course is disease-free survival, uh, we give a single dose of GCSF on day three usually. Um, and that would be the most that I would do in that setting because then there's something wrong. You, know, you have to be looking into what's going on. Uh, to try not to miss a dose and try not to dose delay. And you know, I never, uh, I would say, I almost have never dose reduced in the curative setting. But when we're giving uh, drugs in the metastatic setting, we tend to give a week off. And you know, this was a, something that developed over time simply due to tolerance, and it seems to work okay. Uh, we're never gonna compare continuous dosing because it's not feasible. So. I tend to switch, so if I'm giving three weeks on, one week off, and somebody doesn't tolerate it well, I'll go to two weeks on, one week off, and then I add in growth factors, and the most I've added in is two days, you know, day three, four for a patient who really has neutropenia all the time that's delaying things. Um, but I think it's a balance, as I'm, I know you have a lot of opinions about, in terms of balancing cost and efficacy. No, you're absolutely right. It's a question of balance. and. Uh, it's also, if you look at guideline committees and uh, the uh, ESMO committee and the URTC in Europe uh, have come to the conclusion that in the setting of metastatic disease, it's very difficult to find a setting in which it is very important to keep the dose intensity. So we, are, we would say in those settings, try to find if there's another well-tolerated and efficacious treatment for these patients. And nowadays we have so many choices that sometimes we can do these treatments without the use of a growth factor. But there's also some interesting settings nowadays where we speak about neutropenia. And uh, just yesterday, I got again a call from one of the nurses. A patient arrived in the clinic, and she is in one of, on one of the CDK46 uh, inhibitors, and uh, she had neutropenia. And this new nurse in our unit was all nervous, said, oh, neutropenia, uh, the cancer treatment. Uh, uh, doctor, what should I do? Right. So what about CDK4-6? <clears throat> well, of course, you know, we know that the neutropenia that's generated from CDK4-6 inhibitors is through uh, actually a different mechanism than by cytotoxic chemotherapy where you destroy the progenitors. And in this situation, uh, you're really inhibiting the cell cycle. But when you remove the drug, the effect is gone. So you don't have the same degree of neutropenia. So therefore, because recovery is faster, you don't have the same issue about recovery time, but there's something else in there, which is that when you give cytotoxic chemotherapy and you get neutropenia, neutropenic, the combination of that uh, cytotoxic effect and neutropenia, as we all know from having seen this before growth factor time, causes mouth sores and infections and risks that you just don't see with these CDK4-6 inhibitors. You don't see the mucosal damage, and it's really because the drugs themselves work differently. They're not uh, causing the overall cell kill. Uh, what was fascinating to me, you know, as, a, as a, already a faculty member, was when we started using growth factors for every three week and now every two week chemotherapy, is we stopped seeing mouth sores, essentially. We stopped seeing the same kinds of toxicity that we had before we had growth factors. So clearly, that absence of neutrophils that's caused by overall cell death is different than what we're seeing with the CDK4-6 inhibitors where you're simply of impacting the progenitors that are dependent on that you're enzyme. slowing them down. You're and not then they them. start up again, and it takes them about a week to 10 days to recover. Yep. No, absolutely. What you mentioned is very important uh, in the use of growth factors. We have always concentrated because of the label that they are against neutropenia. But uh, I remember uh, years ago when Miguel Martin did one uh, of the studies uh, using chemotherapy with and without growth factors, he indeed indicated very clearly what you just said, that not only do we reduce neutropenia, but we use these uh, um, ulcerations and we reduce diarrhea. So there's also that benefit for the patients that I think it's very important to highlight. But what about the use of the daily injections versus the long acting? In which settings would you prefer long acting? You know, it's such an interesting question because there's a uh, financial aspect to it too, which thankfully is gonna go away with the advent of biosimilars and these drugs going off patent. Um, we have always favored the long acting single injection of growth factor for our regimens that have a reasonable, you know, following the guidelines, 18, 22% risk of, 
uh, febrile neutropenia, um, and you know the uh, the toxicity that goes along with it that you just mentioned, uh, that makes it so hard for patients to get through their treatment and really delays recovery and increases hospitalization. So we found it much easier to just have a patient come in the next day or have the drug delivered for regimens that are every two to three weeks in uh, schedule. Uh, but others have used the daily injection simply for cost control with the idea that you might be able to give five to seven doses of GCSF instead. It hasn't been really a tolerable approach with our patients. It's interesting now that you can give, you know, the whole idea of whether it's the biosimilar or the generic or how you're doing it, uh, be, you know, we're not going to have generics for growth factors. The biosimilars are our are, are sort of category of generics, right? Uh, but one way to get around that is to change the delivery system. So now we have this uh, agent where you put, which I refer to as a cockroach, but uh, a little white uh, bug on your skin yeah, you have that and it injects indeed. the next day and it doesn't hurt and it's really easy for patients. And that's actually ended up being our go-to now for using long-acting growth factors. So dose dense uh, AC and for docetaxelcyclophosphamide, we tend to use that. Now docetaxelcyclophosphamide in somebody who's healthy and doesn't have problems, hasn't been gotten prior chemo, which is most of them, I can give five days of GCSF and they'll be fine. So I do tend to do that sometimes to avoid the bone pain. You just mentioned about the duration of GCSF. The guidelines say that we should respect the uh, label, which says beyond neutropenia. And we have very little studies about five days versus respecting the label, but some of these studies which are admittedly retrospective for most of them, indicate that nevertheless, it's better to continue beyond in really uh, uh, neutropenic chemotherapies uh, uh, beyond these five days. And that's where the long acting uh, steps in. And we have data comparing long acting and short acting, which tends to show that long acting in those settings where the chemotherapy is really uh, giving a neutropenia to the patients is a better product. Uh, what's your take on this one? You know, I, I, I agree in most settings. I think docetaxel and cyclophosphamide for four cycles seems to be something that's in the middle. That's been my experience. Yeah. So when I give a long-acting growth factor to a healthy young person, you know, they get a lot of bone pain despite using antihistamines, which work really well for bone pain and, you know, it are not universally used for some unclear reason. I think it's mainly knowledge and not being on the label, but really a very useful symptom control mechanism uh, for somewhat unclear reasons. I don't know if you have insight into that. But uh, the, so we give the long acting growth factor in situations where the, the treatment is more intensive and you know it has that greater than 20% risk. But you know, docetaxel cyclophosphamide falls in the middle. You know, it's too much febrile neutropenia to not give it. You know, first two patients I treated, I remember they didn't use the drug. Ever, both were admitted with febrile neutropenia. It's like, okay, this is not a good idea. But uh, on the other hand, you know, giving five days of uh, GCSF seems to have completely eliminated the problem. So you know, that's been trial and error. So that's a unique regimen. For all other situations like that, I tend to use the long-acting growth factor. You just mentioned younger patients, and of course you know my interest for our older patients. Uh, guidelines indicate that patients above the age of 65, which is an artificial definition of older people, uh, we should be more careful. Do you agree with this? I do, and I think you know we tend to uh, already do that. That doesn't mean in a curative setting, which I've seen a lot, and I know you have as well, that you start with inadequate chemo. Like that seems to me like you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Why would you give something you don't know is as effective? So I tend to try and maintain the dose intensity, but I use more supportive care and we check in much more frequently. You, you know, you, it's an interesting question. You really have to be very, very cautious. And I think if somebody who doesn't tolerate it, I'd rather take off the last dose rather than dose reduce and give the same amount. I think we would do the same also uh, in my center, in my European centers. Well, thank you, Hope. As usual, a very nice discussion with you. Any topic, we can always have a good exchange. We can exchange. always discuss. Very nice to talk to you, too, across thank the you. ocean. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.